Hey everyone, this is Tom, and this week's character is Aelus for Manuel. Uh, Aelus is a uh, wood elf, he's a fighter, a chaotic good soldier, um, you'll see a lot of the details showing in, they're popping up in the list there. Um, but uh, once again, a good character to draw, nice and challenging. Um, but this time I went about uh, working out the figure in a little bit more of a different way. Uh, moving forward, I want to try out a bunch of different uh, approaches if I can, try them out, uh, even just for myself, see if it helps the process, see if it uh, unlocks anything, see if it helps you out if there's anything new that I uh, come across or show you or anything. Um, I've had some people in, in recent times show me different sort of things that they've tried out. There's one that stands out where it's sort of like a spiral approach where rather than building up a figure with uh, geometric shapes or terrestrial forms or anything, it's just sort of like this little, uh, it looks like a, like a tornado doodle going around sort of highlighting the forms. They can actually do a pretty good job because it just makes everything look like a rendered cylinder or something. So uh, going through, um, lining up uh, usually about seven, seven and a half heads high. It was a pretty good start for a human or a humanoid figure. Um, I mean, humans for sure, but in the case of an elf, I figure them being just a little bit, uh, in this case, I didn't want them to seem like too majestic or, or massive. I think, it, when I think of that sort of elf, it's usually reserved for like a high elf kind of thing, like being much more lithe and drawn out. <clears throat> uh, so for this guy, I just want him to be a little bit more humanoid formed with the uh, halfway point of the figure between, halfway, exactly halfway between the crotch and the belly button, or thereabouts. I think that's a good thing. So in this case, I'm sort of going the uh, how to draw comics the Marvel way sort of approach, where you start off with the really loose point-to-point uh, -point basic underlying skeleton, and then going over it with simple geometric shapes to block out the form and sort of chip away at things. And and, and each stage lends itself to the next, and it, it all just works up from like the foundation uh, forward and forward. Everything always gives you something to build from. That's one of the benefits of starting off with, uh, I mean, it's obvious to start off with the sketch, but um, starting off with, uh, especially if you're more new to drawing, um, or you're not that confident, starting off with like a really basic sketch, like a stick figure. As long as a stick figure is in proportion, you're, you're, you're pretty much guaranteed to be working out with a, or you're going to end up with a, um, like a proportioned, uh, proper uh, illustration, but... Um, one of the best parts, if you need convincing, about starting off with a basic sketch is that it's easy to change. You don't get married to it, you're not stuck, uh, locked in, where if you doodled a leg and you just loved it and you knew it was great, but you knew you had to change it to adjust the pose, you'd be, it'd, you'd be a little bit more reluctant to. Whereas if you're just working with a skeleton, like a stick figure, um, then it's just a line. You can easily get it up, get it out the door. Uh, so that's that's the practical best reason to start off just with the simple line art sketch. So um, blocking in just cylindrical uh, um, limbs and torso and what have you. Uh, if it helps, if you're not quite used to putting the uh, the ellipse um, representing the ends of the cylinder, you can just put the two side uh, lines on either side of the, of the cylinder showing like the, the side of it. That can help get your mind in the right place and that can be all you need sometimes. You don't necessarily have to have the the ellipse or the circle at the ends. Um, also here uh, I wanted to kind of go through a bit more slowly and with just sort of showing with uh, simpler shapes just sort of blocking and stuff making sure like with the line down the middle that it's all um, lining up and everything's working. Uh, just little by little chipping it away and it doesn't have to be uh, too messy. I, I'm definitely going to be exploring this uh, sort of geometric approach a bit more. I remember uh, um, for a long time uh, like the how to draw com comics the Marvel way was sort of like a it seemed sort of cheesy and kind of not that good but then I, I watched it when I was uh, a teacher I just saw a clip online and it made me watch the whole thing, uh, and it's actually very good advice. And I've watched it a few times because it kind of helps demystify everything. It's just a, um, I can't remember the name of the artist who was doing the drawings, but watching him build up the figure that way just 
took away all the um all the grandiosity out of it and he was just like hey you just draw it this way you just do this and this and there you go and he was right and it's not a matter of remembering that this is the shape of that and um first draw a circle and then a triangle and then connect these two it's it wasn't like that it was just like you pose the figure you get it how you like it and then build it up through these steps and it, it was a really good approach so i i always i would recommend that to anybody if they ask me where to start as far as like what would be a good uh um a, a good how to draw book um as far as actually how to draw uh, that would be a good one i often recommend like andrew loomis books if you want to get into anatomy and proportion and and things like that but he's quite a bit more technical the how to draw comics the marvel way is a good a really good breakdown and whether you're a pro or an expert or a novice or a or a hobbyist or anything um it's it's worth watching and it's nice to just kind of be reminded of how fun it can be it doesn't have to be too serious all the time so once i get the pose just working in the muscles and things muscles and bones. In the case of a wood elf being stockier, and I, I don't see their skeleton being noticeably that different from a human, so I didn't think to add any sort of um, different sort of factors. A lot of the times when I do like high elves and, and more elfy elves, I'll usually try to do like a slighter sort of skeleton, but it kind of makes me think I'm just a little, starting to get a little bit paranoid that uh, I'm drawing the bones too big or clunky when they shouldn't, but that's going to get just get fixed with time. And I think if you ever get nervous about uh, <clears throat> what you're drawing or what you're not getting right, or if you start questioning your ability to work on a particular thing, that that's a good thing. I, that, that happens that's to me all the time, and um, I think that that's a, a sign of uh, growth, and you should use that as a as a guide to show you like what you should be working on um even in myself in the past year there's been times when i've been looking at skulls and doing lots of references and i just um one part in particular just getting frustrated with how vague uh eye sockets actually are um eventually you know i mean you can be comfortable enough in just putting down like a black hole but especially around the bridge of the nose it's actually a very gradual transition into the actual socket uh and it just drove me nuts because I just wanted it to be like, it's this shape, it's that simple, just remember that and you're good. Um, but after going over it and drawing lots of skulls, I kind of, I feel like I'm getting better used to the skulls. And even like, um, especially the area on the zygomatic arch, which is that uh, the cheekbone going back to, to where your ear, your ear hole is, your ear port. Uh, even that is a lot more complicated than I thought, and I finally just bit the bullet and sat there and got used to it, and, and, and now I can kind of doodle it out without using reference, but that's sort of, that sort of stuff happens all the time, and you forget stuff and you need to remember it, but, um, like, I don't think you'll ever, I don't think any artist ever gets to a point where they just, where they have everything locked in perfectly, um, maybe in the future I might have that, or if, if there are any artists... Uh, that have that, please let me know and tell me how you got it. So with this character, with Alice, I kind of wanted to <clears throat> um, take a bit of time with the drawing, especially on the face. Just uh, There's something about sometimes just inking things digitally just doesn't have the right kind of personality that I want. Especially, I think for me, the the biggest problem is that when... For me, this is a really large drawing. Like, the the scale of the lines to the actual size of the image. So it's very thin lines, very little lines, and I'm used to working on drawings that are about an inch or two tall in my sketchbook and, and the lines are a lot thicker. And so it's sort of out of, I'm sort of out of my element when I'm doing these, but I wanted to take time to add little bits of slight rendering and detail and and uh, and grit to the face. Just I think it's just good. I, I start getting nervous when I draw something like a like an arm and it's just totally blank and it's just the outline and it just it feels unfinished something feels wrong about it but uh, that's part of doing all this just noticing my blind spots and my shortcomings and my flaws and, and getting uh, getting used to it just getting at it and trying to improve in every every way that I can um, <clears throat> 
So I wanted to, uh, even though he's a wood elf, um, they still live quite a long time. Uh, Aelis is about, i um, pretty sure he's about 250 years old or so. Uh, yeah, he's 250. Um, and even though that's not even, that's technically, that's, I guess, um, he probably, it could be argued that he'd look kind of younger and fairer. Uh, but, um, I wanted him to have a, at least a bit of age. Um, I think elves, the ideas of, like, characters that are, like, eternally youthful or, like, really young looking for a long time, um, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just, to me, it, I find it less interesting, even just less visually interesting than just someone with a lot more character in their face, uh, like wrinkles and, um, like five o'clock shadow or, or whatever, just something that looks just a little bit more, like, weary, like, showing, like, the wisdom in the face, the age there. I think it's more of just, like, the mark of somebody who's been around a long time is that they know a lot more, their, their personality has changed, they may be less optimistic or... Or maybe they're, well, I may, sometimes, a lot of times people get more optimistic, but, um, but in a world of adventures and monsters and magic, I, th I think somebody would get a bit world-weary and, and, and more grim and somber in most cases. And I saw, based on this guy's history, I thought that that might be the case, so I wanted to, a, a face that had, um, weariness in it, uh, and I can, we can go in, once we get into his backstory and everything, um, Definitely talk more about that. But yeah, um, elven characters can be tough. There's a lot of sort of standard looks for elves, um, and I want to. Every time I draw elves, I want them to look um, distinct from one another, uh, just like humans do. Um, but it's also they still do have to look elven, but that's going to take some. Some practice to get something like that working, but even just having pointy elf, uh, pointy elf ears can help quite a bit uh, with that. It's thankfully it's just simple blocking in of a of an of a of a bow. So, well, I guess while this is working out, uh, I may as well just uh, go over his uh, backstory. So this is what Manuel sent to me. So. Um, just, I'll just go through all the all the stuff here. So, he's a wood elf. He is a fighter. With a, he's an archer. Um, sort of like a subclass of uh, these are al archetype of eldritch knight. Uh, an ar eldritch knight. He's chaotic good. Uh, he's a soldier, level three, two hundred fifty years old. Um, dark green eyes, brown hair. He's about six feet, one hundred fifty pounds. So pretty lean. Um, one of my friends in high school had those sorts of dimensions, and I remember him being weirdly thin. Well, not weirdly thin, but he was just distinct, and he would comment on it often. Uh, let's see, personality, okay. Okay, so his personality trait. This is this is kind of like the fun character building stuff from like the, from the player's handbook. I like this sort of stuff. Uh, personality trait. I'm full of tales from my time in the army concerning almost all combat situations. It's ideal. Is my people or group is all that matters. Bonds, people you are fighting with are worth dying for. Flaw. Uh, that, in case that's confusing, people you are fighting with uh, is people who are you are fighting side by side with, not fighting against. Uh, so it's flaw. I have no respect for people who are not proven fighters. So this is kind of a cut bait uh, kind of guy. Uh, even though he tries to shake off his time in the army, he still has some mannerisms that show his past. Shaving in the morning, always clear, uh, cleaning his shoes and weapons, light sleep, etc. But on the other hand, his repulsion against any form of authority or system is bigger than ever. Okay, so he's got some sweet stats. Not too strong, mostly dexterity. Okay, my cat keeps walking in front of my computer here. Come here. There you go. Okay. Okay, so okay, let's go down to his background. So, Aelis grew up in a rather small uh, wood elf village together with his family, his parents and his sister. 
His parents were rather famous for their woodworking, which was also the reason why they believed in Gond, the god of craftsmanship. Even with their strange beliefs, the family was well respected, and even beyond the village, uh, famous for their craft. This is until the village got overrun by orc plunderers. Everybody died except for Aelis, who, after seeing his parents getting brutally murdered in front of his eyes, fell unconscious and was left there. He was found by a human, uh, by a human knight and his entourage. They took care of him, or they took care of him, but it turned out that he lost all memories of the attack. All he knew is that it had to do with orcs. That led to him joining the army, which the human knight was a part of, and hunting as many orcs as possible. It's a pretty sweet gig, uh, if I do say so myself. Uh, this lasted for a pretty long time, but he got older and had to see uh, how his own army did similar things to other races and started to have doubts. He stayed in this army for a pretty long time and climbed the ranks. In the end, he had a platoon of scouts under his command, this lasted until the day he was ordered to leave his men behind, uh, such that they could be used as bait for a bigger assault. One of the one of his personality traits is that until you uh, fight, or until uh, um, oh, oh yeah oh okay, is that a unit you fight in is your life, and you would do everything for them. So he did. He saved his men and jeopardized the whole mission. Higher ups didn't like that and dishonorably discharged him. This whole ordeal led to Aelis overthinking his whole stance on life, and in the end led to him changing his alignment to chaotic good. He began living outside of the system, wandering through the lands he wanted to help the poor and the weak. This was until he met the party he is in now, and they started their adventure. After some battles together, something strange happened in one of his dreamlike meditations. Gond, the god of his childhood, appeared and talked to him. He tells him that he watched him for some time now, and he is impressed. Even if it isn't the thing, uh, things his worshippers usually do. Uh, he also tells him how sad he was when he witnessed the death of his parents, and how he wanted Aelis to get something back. So he gives him powers. Uh, that's the Eldritch Knight. Suddenly Aelis wakes up and is overwhelmed. Together with his new powers, there also came the memories. He remembers everything and nearly collapses. After he pulled himself together, he also remembers Gond giving him a task. That is where we stopped last time. So that's the whole up-to-date story <clears throat> about this guy. Um, Equipment-wise, he's a very versatile fighter and uses many different kinds of weapons, but his favorite is the longbow. In addition to that, he wields a special longsword he found. Its hilt is formed like an eagle with the wings as the guard. Sometimes he uses an iron shield, uh, which he has on his back. Uh, concerning armor, he wears simple, a simple mixture of chain and leather armor, making him fast and agile, and still giving him some prediction. <clears throat> so that's Aelis. Very cool character. Okay, so working on the outfit here, just blocking it in generally with just simple uh, blobby brush. Um, it's important to... Um, I haven't talked much about like the importance of silhouette. Uh, the silhouette is... Um, the out the the general overall form and shape of the character it's sort of like their shadow if you just if you looked at it now and squinted your eyes you would see this shape with some spikes and some lines and some feet sticking out and that's the silhouette um, silhouette is a um, absolute a very very major um, factor when designing characters uh, silhouette is important um, I mean, so a bunch of the reasons. Um, <clears throat> the human eye sees uh, movement first, before color. When you have a character in, say, uh, a video game, um, you recognize everything. You, it goes straight to your brain first by what things are, by how things are moving, and, and the way that your brain sees that is it's by the shape of it. So. The bigger, more over overarching, or overarching shape that a character has is is the way that your brain first connects it uh, and and brings it up in like your memory banks or whatever. So that helps with not only um, keeping your character uh, distinguishable in a big mess of lots of characters, but it also helps make them more memorable and categorizable uh, in your brain. So. My favorite example is always just drawing the three circles that make up Mickey Mouse. Everybody recognizes that. 
or even just like the shape of Batman's cowl with his shoulders and his head and the two ears that put the top. Everybody recognizes that. It's just, that's the silhouette. That's the power of it. Um, <clears throat> a really good principle, especially when you're starting off with character design, is working with a silhouette that kind of turns the character into uh, an icon of what they are. Excuse me. <clears throat> so if you're doing a character that's a fighter or a barbarian, I mean, a, a tacky bad example would be uh, a muscular guy with, uh, <clears throat> he's got um, an axe in one hand and some horns sticking out of his helmet. And people that are familiar with fantasy games and that genre and like all the tropes there, uh, they would recognize like, okay, that's the fighter. You see somebody with a big tall pointy hat and uh, and a big, and some, and you can't see his legs being distinct. They're all in one big sort of body of fabric. That's a, that's a wizard. Everybody knows the wizard. <clears throat> So people sort of, um, it's it's that iconography, and that doesn't mean you have to make a fighter look like that, and it doesn't mean it's a constraint, but it's something that you can play with. Where, if whatever you're choosing to do, this I mean, it is optional. Is um, <clears throat> if you can tell, if somebody, if your friend, if you can do, if you can draw the silhouette of your character and show your friend, and they can tell what they are, that's a really good sign. Like if they can tell you like one thing about them or like the main thing about them, then that's uh probably means you're off to a great start as far as the silhouette goes. <clears throat> Another major thing with silhouette, especially more from an illustration standpoint from than from a design standpoint, is just making sure that it's not too clustered in. Um, you'll see diagrams sometimes of uh, like a Donald Duck and he's a magician, and he's pulling a rabbit out of a hat and there's one with, that says this is not so good where it's a view um, or his bo his body's just facing the camera and the rabbit is right in front of his chest and it's this and, and it and, and then it shows you the silhouette of that and it's just kind of this lumpy uh, um, like cartoon lump and you can't really tell what's going on but then the one beside I think uh, what's the name of the I can't remember the name of the animator who who always does this um, now it's going to drive me nuts. Uh, but then the alternative is a drawing of him sort of more to the side and his arms are out and you can make out the shape of the top hat and the rabbit and his arms and the motion of the body. And that's sort of labeled as being the good one. And that's important for a lot of reasons. I mean, it makes them, makes the character interesting. It makes it read better. Um, you can just better distinguish separate parts of their costume and their anatomy, uh, and that that's sort of where silhouette comes from, and, and like motion and and personality comes through too. And that and that that's that's one of the main things about silhouette. Um, and there's definitely uh, just lots of other things. It it's good to even at the very least um, thinking about silhouette as a means of um, just making sure that you're not keep making it too blobby or consistent in like that it's like sort of more generalized and homogenized shapes um, make sure that there's lots of like or not too many but make sure that there's a, a healthy dose of um, simple shapes complex shapes little shapes big shapes that there's a dynamic range there that there's not too much thing too many things setting up a bland rhythm of just like boom boom Boom. But you want to have something that's like boom, 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 boom. You know, stuff like that, where you have like shapes and like little pointy shapes, big round shapes, and a balance and, uh, and some sort of neat um, balance like that. Um, what's the? I think it's stress and rest. Those two things there. So that that can account for smaller details or ones around the outside of a of a silhouette. It's stress and rest. So. Big simple shapes where your eye doesn't need to focus on any detail and it's just sort of there to fill it in. And then stress is the neat little details that you get to, to look at and help tell the story a bit more. So that's some stuff about silhouette. That might be a good video to do all by itself. Um, but as we're going through, um, as far as the outfit goes, uh, the main thing that I took away from ALS was his history in the military. Um, and I thought that with uh, 
Manuel's description, particularly of him retaining uh, certain habits like polishing his shoes and uh, or keeping his boots clean and uh, shaving every morning. Um, I thought that that would be kind of good to carry into his design in more places where um, he doesn't necessarily have gear, uh, except I did give him one bit of gear that I kind of thought would be suitable for military stuff in this context, but... Um, Oh, excuse me. Um, oh, what was I saying? I'll come back to it. Um, but yeah, the military history stuff. Uh, you don't want to overdo it, but I think that would affect him a lot. I mean, he had a traumatizing, a very, an, an, un, an unfathomably traumatizing event occur as a child, which landed him directly into the care of the military, just a ward of the state. <laughs> Uh, basically, um, I think that would uh, affect him even though he now disliked the military. I think that would be the life that he knows. Um, it's all he knows, but he's racked with guilt or um, he's questioning it. He's skeptical of motivations and justifications of things like killing orcs and are they all that bad? Do they deserve it? Is he right in doing it? At least that's what I took from the description. Um, so as far as now I did look into it, I didn't find any reference to wood elves growing beards. So I didn't give him any five o'clock shadow. And you know, normally, um, you know, it, it would be clean shaven, so you wouldn't see anything. But in a, in a fantasy setting, and you have a character who is likely just using a knife. And he lives in the wilderness. Uh, it would be sort of a a messier job than if you shaved every day uh, in your house with a with a an official razor. What's a razor brand? Um, it would just be sort of a messier thing. So in this case, I did leave it. I did leave the facial hair out, uh, but I did instead kind of carry that up into his hair. I gave him a really short cropped kind of 1940s military hair, haircut. Um, elves are typically depicted with long hair and things, but I think that this would um, be more in line with, like, human. It's military, it's clean, it's it's short. Um, I do messy it up a little bit with some errant hairs that are a little bit longer. Um, but yeah, it's... Uh, Ooh, another another thought just escaped my mind, but it'll probably come back. Um, but yeah, haircut haircut like that. So not too long, not too short. It's just there, sort of keeps some of the keeps some of the heat in. And cut by himself in his knife, or by it with his with his knife. And uh, oh, yeah, that's what it was. Yeah, he so he's basically like adopted by um, humans. So culturally, he's not really uh, a wood elf. I th I don't know if he was sort of, um, if there's any wood elves around when he was growing up, or if that even mattered, or if it was sort of more like something for, like, a human kingdom. Um, but... It's one of the reasons why I didn't feel too, um, I didn't think it would be too necessary to include any of, like, the typical, like, curly cues and elven features for a design. It's, you know, this guy's... He's... It'd be... It's good to still have some of that, because people, if they play as a different race they like to have those things that sort of visually distinguish them like curly cues and stuff um but i think there there's even already enough with this guy um that helped him make or just made him sort of wood elf looking by his very nature things like green and brown color palettes leather i did give him some of that um wood elfy sort of nature curly cut stuff with the leather armor going around is like with that leather sash and shoulder pad sort of thing um but the the strange thing I, i've started noticing these patterns and the one that i noticed that i remembered with this guy was that him and zook the the previous video they were both uh, non-humans raised by humans it's another one of those strange coincidences very particular things it's not those sort of boring general co coincidences like they both have the letter A in their name or something. It's, it's like a weird 
particular aspect of the character or the or even like the, the person who submitted it in this case there's, there was I don't, um yeah there was a weird coincidence with them too but i won't go into the personal <laughs> the personal details of uh of the people who who win these things so um so i did give him some military boots they're based on british world war one officer boots um the details sort of show up more as as we paint into them but um with those uh i wanted them to look really old but well maintained now he because he was in the military when he was a young boy and he's 250 years old so if those are his military boots um they're anywhere from uh 240 to two years old so they should look they should still look ratty and worn out and brutal but there should be like some shine, a little bit of shine to them or like a smoothness to them. Like they, they're not, they haven't been rejected, but you know, time is going to show and they are made by humans. They're not like amazing elven craft or anything. They're some sort of military issue. Um, but with that and the haircut, which is sort of, to me, that was sort of the main, um, human military, or the military sort of thing that came through the description. But the one thing I also wanted to give him was sort of the, um, uh, the, like the green, Vietnam vet fantasy version uh, jacket uh, in the States having um, like that uh, Vietnam vet look is sort of a distinct thing and with the situation that they were put in especially after coming home and sort of it's like kind of like a it's a really um, sort of a, a uncomfortable relationship with that military past in a lot of cases uh, and just sort of like that um, that rejected warrior, uh, that iconography, I guess you could say, I hope I'm not wrong or, or, or crapping on any, uh, history, but, um, I thought it was just suitable, just having like that, just a big, a big green, a longer green jacket. The, the one in, the ones in real life aren't that big, but I thought it'd be fitting for military. It's elven and it's got sort of like that bad blood with the past kind of look so yeah with this boot wanting to to give it uh like cracks between in or like light it's lightening up in the wrinkles uh you know just reinforcing the toe as well to help make it look a bit more fantasy uh it could have been mending jobs done over the years and then there's a tall <sighs> some buckles and a flap going over the top something a bit more office officer looking he did get to some rank with him having a uh, a group to to lead there of scouts so yeah not not too much not too much detail here just just fancy fancy brushwork just blobs and the bit the best thing about this is that it's only uh there are only three colors except for the buckle. I guess the buckle makes it four colors. Um, but it's that tan with the black uh, occlusion layer, and then a slightly reddish brown for the leather uh, patch over top of the, the inside of the ankle there. I, I just, I, I love doing it, and I always recommend using as few colors as you can to tell or to describe what something is. Um, if you if that's something that you're interested in, I'd recommend any or if you wanted to kind of pursue it or practice it, is try doing some still lives and using only three or four colors per each object, like a, like paint some uh, or paint like some uh, jujubes or uh, plastic colored plastic crystals, or if you have some of those cool uh, transparent dice. With the color, uh, with the colored plastic, and then get some light shining through it. That'd be that'd be a good place to start with some something metallic or some fruit. But limit yourself to three or four colors at maximum, um, not excluding white for speculars if you need them. But that'll that'll help a lot. You can do a lot with a few colors in it. Things often tend to look better. So yeah, wrinkly and wet sort of worn leather. I mean, they could have been far more aged, but, uh, you know, that, that would 
take a long time. <laughs> and I think the point was made. Um, so yeah, he's got he's got an archery. Uh, or, uh, he's got a, <laughs> he has a quiver hanging down, uh, being an archer himself. There. Um, as far as the armor that he's got, with it's a mix of the leather and the chainmail, and there's uh, a lot of ways to do that sort of stuff. Um, I watched a, uh, a, a a nice little video about chainmail, and the I'll rec I'll definitely um, post this guy's YouTube channel in the future onto Twitter. But uh, he was talking about putting together chainmail stuff for his um, LARPing and recreate uh, reenactment stuff, and he's talking about doing it in triangles. He he, uh, he made a bunch of little triangles uh, of of chainmail. Rather and and then he would sort of put them together as as he made them, and one of the neat things that he mentioned about this was that it was uh, I don't remember the term he used, but it, it was it was to do with closure or like a sense of accomplishment. Where if you could spend eight days or a whole day, like eight hours, just working on a massive sheet, and by comparison of what you've done in eight hours, because it's spread out over such a large area or a large sort of spot, it's hard to see the sort of work that you've accomplished how much you've done but if you do a bunch of little triangles then you know you get a sense of like oh okay i've got this much time yeah i could do a whole chunk as big as my hand uh and that's a good thing you can you can see your progress and it makes it easier to keep going uh or to do a little bit more or to know what you're capable of and i thought that was extremely fascinating i love learning stuff about the techniques of, of let's just like real hands experience of making things and that led to the next point where he sort of, again, there's another term for it, I'll have to find it again, but um, about making like sheets and, um, uh, uh, what was it, is it a hauberk? Uh, sort of like the, the chainmail coats, um, where it's like big sheets of it, uh, is made of triangles forming squares or rectangles. And so you'd build it from top to bottom and as you go you do one layer and it would m make be make a jagged toothy edge with triangles and then you do you do another pass and it would make it square and flat and flush and then you do another one and it would hang down with triangles and then you'd go back around and do it and, and then it would be flat and flush and square and just growing up seeing chainmail things in games and movies and on in documentaries and stuff you'd sometimes see the pointy bottoms and you sometimes see the flat bottoms. And I thought it was neat that that was more just a matter of the uh, of the fabrication process rather than a design sense. I mean, it would often probably be left jaggedy or flat because of what their design choice was. But very cool to see how that's just the result of something incredibly practical. Um, so in this case, I thought I'd, uh, I'd just keep it pointy. Um, with him going into off into the woods... I mean, he's a wood elf, so it makes sense to have things be a little bit more visually interesting. Um, I think flat would be good for uh, like something much more industrialized or uh, generic, intentionally generic. Um, but it works well with the elfishness. But with him being an archer that goes off into the woods, he's a vigilante and he does good deeds... There's an obvious uh, Robin Hood parallel there, and cliche or not, Robin Hood is my favorite fictional character, and I saw it as a, uh, well, quote-unquote fictional character. Wink, wink. Uh, <laughs> either way, um, I thought it was a great opportunity to throw in at least a little bit of that iconography in there, too, with the, sort of like the, the tacky, um, like, old movie-style, like, outfit with, like, the... Uh, the uh, like the scalloped cowl and hood with the little pattern there and uh, uh, having that look brought in would be nice nice to include i thought it was just a little bit robin hoodish and that was fine by me the uh the leather bit i thought it'd be nice to have like i kind of i was picturing it as being something part of like a part of his his history where it's sort of built like a sh uh uh a, uh, a sash going diagonally across his chest, something that would um, serve as armor, and it would be good for 
like asymmetrical movement and fighting, which would be nice for an archer. Um, uh, but also, sort of when on parade, you see like the badges on the sash sometimes, and you know it just makes sense to have like a place for that sort of thing. So it'd be sort of like a higher ranking badge or a sort of military uniform. Shoulder pads, because it's fantasy, and what are you going to do? you got to have them. And then uh, he's got this sort of a half cape that goes around, and well, my idea for that is it was inspired by, like, the, um, like the chain skirting that they have on tanks, and, like, military tanks, and it's sort of like a... It's like a an like a like an energy dissipating curtain wall armor where it's sort of meant to um because it's just this big floppy uh sheet of leather and it may be reinforced with some chain mail here and there like in sort of like a in like a double layer of of leather if it needed um it's it'd be like a lightweight flexible quiet easy to move inobtrusive way to at least absorb some of the impact from arrows and sort of um basically it's like trying to play handball against the drapes uh, to quote a phrase where you just throw something at like some drapes like a ball and you, and you want it to bounce back but it just roll, hits hits it and then drops to the floor that was that was that was my idea for it um it's also good for um uh like sneaking around in the woods um mainly for silhouette disruption so, uh, with talk about silhouette and humans and their eyes recognizing shapes instantly in motion, um, human bodies stand out really quickly and easily to human eyes and like basically all symmetry does. So if you can have something that alters your silhouette to be asymmetrical, then even if somebody sees you move, you might be able to just sort of be passed off as a shadow. Um... So yeah, it's sort of doing double duty there for this guy. So that's what that weird uh, asymmetrical one-sided cape wall thing is. Is it's 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 archer armor. At least one idea for it. So also with his face. Now that he's got some more face, um, talking about age and personality and sort of taking that liberty with showing age on the face it's not it's not too wrinkly like uh it he doesn't have like bags under his eyes or um or uh laugh lines or anything or crow's feet that's the term uh even though on real people those are usually quite a lot more subtle looking than than i draw them um but those are typically the marks of older older faces the bags under the eyes and crow's feet and then um usually wrinkles on the cheeks and stuff but um sometimes people have these uh creases in their cheeks that's um kind of like a like a tom Selleck kind of line that like this that vertical dimple that goes deep um i thought it, like that would be a good way to add just sort of a a bit of an agedness or a ruggedness to them without needing to go into too many other details because once you start adding stuff to the corners of the mouth or along the bottom of the jawline or around the nose it can get pretty pretty old pretty quick and I thought that would be pretty suitable it'd be a fair compromise um, but I wanted him to look world weary he does he, he is a vigilante on the run living in the woods um, with a life full of doubt and regret and you know war's not what it was and combat's not what it was you know he's got he's got a lot more empathy for orcs and he doesn't blame them so much and who knows what he's done but you know i just he, i just wanted him to look tired and i think he looks pretty tired <laughs> Miss skeptical he's got the one eyebrow raised sort of like he's not impressed with something that's just happened or what somebody has just said to him or he's like, okay, now I gotta go deal with that.
you know, with painting, especially with skin, um, you, it is nice to come back and add pink on top of stuff a lot of the time, especially if you're doing somebody who is uh, younger or still has a lot of energy or life or they're, or they're, um, they're not evil. Um, a lot of like uh, certain characters will have flatter color palette skin where it's just more of a, a like a one note where it's like a really pale yellowish kind of cast but it's really even and you don't have that that variation where there's blood flowing and and that can help make a character look like older or um, uh, plastic if they're plastic but having facial or just any sort of skin variation is is really important for getting skin right um, especially on faces but even like hands and elbows and whatever but you don't want to go too hog wild on the the facial uh, hue variation like on the ears and nose and cheeks um, it's really easy to go too hard on the nose it's almost like a a stylistic thing that happens a lot artistically where people um, I don't know when it started but it's I don't remember seeing it much before like 2004 um, but now it seems like a lot of people draw red noses. Uh, yeah, before it was really rare. Um, but yeah, just don't do it overboard or else it looks kind of, I think it looks sort of gimmicky. And if you go too hard, it can make it look like they're an alcoholic or they have like a, like a gin blossom nose, I think it's called. So yeah, just be careful. And when in doubt, just find reference. Look up the sort of pictures of the sort of people you're going for and see kind of how that worked out. Yeah, just as always, lots of meticulous detail. Now, even though he does uh, groom his hair and his boots daily or regularly, I did keep his nails dirty underneath. Um, I think he figured, you know, nails get dirty really quick, especially if you're outside. And I think he would probably just clean them at the like in the morning or at the end of the day. And so there's plenty of time for his nails to get dirty, uh, even though that's something that uh, military men would be trained to deal with. So here's an extra little bit of a flap, just making it a bit like a more like a duster. just with one line sort of outlining the underside of it and some cast shadow and then generalizing the values on the f upper flap on the outer flap it kind of helps make it look like it's related it's slightly being affected by the shapes underneath but it's not directly one to one with this i figured some sort of ascot or uh, cravat would sort of help make him look a bit more um uh, seasoned or wise or more mature something a bit more officerial or like dignified but also being a vigilante it's something that could also be pulled up over his face and I didn't want to just give him a hood I think a lot of elves have hoods and I sort of wanted to get away from that a little bit so this is something you could pull up I guess sort of like an infinity scarf or something uh, just just right there just big thick woolen nice and warm I picture him being in the rain a lot when I think of rain, raining a lot, and elves and archers, I think of England, and or just all those sort of like uh, like British Isles, and it's, it's probably just an unfair stereotype, but just like cable knit sweaters, uh, something something but put that in my mind. So yeah, just cozy. I don't think villains would really wear cable knit sweaters, except for. That one Will Ferrell movie where he played Mugatu and he had big sweaters, but I think it's it's a very fr they're, they're a friendly kind of safe look. Also, even though he would probably keep better care of uh, his equipment, I thought by having uh, rust forming on his chainmail, it makes it not only it not only gives away the fact that he's outside a lot, but also trying to find those ways to show that he's been around for a long time without needing to put wrinkles on his uh, face or hands. 
Uh, I thought that would be a, a good visual cue. Where this this chain this chainmail is old. Like it's it's really old. I mean, if you had chainmail and you just left it out for ten years, it would be a mess. Uh, but if this guy's been if this guy's two hundred and fifty years old, he's gonna have some stuff that's that's older than like the country I live in, and that's really old. The one thing that's really good about painting is, is once you get to a certain point, you have sort of like an underlying uh, amount of work done. Uh, it makes overpainting a lot easier and quicker and more comfortable and, and feels more natural. Uh, so if you ever need to just like quickly blob in like a new shirt collar or a bit of equipment, it becomes just a lot easier. I think a big part of it is just having a lot of the colors already chosen and you can just um, like use, use the painting itself as a color palette. And I think a lot of the like rendering and lighting information is already sort of figured up for you and it, it just it kind of it gets more fun as you go I think a lot more a lot easier building it up is the challenging process I think um, you know as you build it up and get get going I think a piece just becomes more and more comfortable sadly that's like right at the end that that happens but it still happens Lots of sitting and looking and thinking. So for his, um, for his quiver, I just wanted something really practical looking. It could have been military, it could have been standard issue, it's not too fancy or anything, but uh, just really practical. This guy's not trying to win any awards. And then just some nice sort of belt buckle details. Just carvings and decorations and you gotta have those nice little details when doing illustrations even if it's f f uh, sci-fi but more so with fantasy uh, the, hist the showing the visual history of fabrication is uh, really valuable like things like stitching or all marks or um, like if you're doing metal just having like sort of like the the, the peened out metal texture and just stuff like that is really important to learn about and I mean I talk about it a lot but uh, good good reference for that is just watching like how it's made uh, or just any sort of blacksmithing or leather working or stonemasonry or um, or uh, like working with fabric or like tailoring and just seeing how stuff actually gets done especially if you can find it in uh, like old-timey uh, medieval techniques and equipment it's just incredibly beneficial for doing this sort of work so it's got this found sword, so it doesn't have to match any sort of culture in particular. Like it doesn't know where it's from, uh, at least it wasn't mentioned in the description, so I take that as being sort of vague. So it doesn't have to match any known human uh, outfit or uh, wood elf or military. It's completely sort of up to me. So um, there's something being ornate enough to be not only made of gold, but also carved into uh, an eagle. <laughs> sculpted into an eagle and its wings are uh the guard it's it's gonna be pretty fancy so i wanted to just give it enough of a look that just had sort of that uh just ornate gold work kind of carved i guess it's sort of like a sort of like a chandelier or like a like an ornate fancy light fixture of some kind i think i picture this sword being like um yeah I don't want to spoil the story if it's how it's going to go, if they ever find out or if it matters, but, you know, something that, like, a king lost, basically. I mean, it's not really, like, a an earth-shattering sort of thing, but I, I figure maybe it's, like, a... like a, it's, it, it could show up as, like, a lost and found or, like, a chosen one sword, where it, he comes back to some some kingdom, and it turns out that, you know, whoever holds this sword is the proper whatever, but... That was just me daydreaming while I worked on this. Gold is tough. It's something I want to do more studies on. Um, a lot of weird colors in gold. There's greens and oranges and 
and grays and blacks and even like the uh, the amount of yellowness to it uh, changes depending on the percentage of gold um, whether it's 10 carat 14 carat or 24 carat it can vary quite a bit the more the higher the carats the more yellow it is and the more orange and even um, depending on its purity um, or if it's actually real, will affect how much of uh, the colors of the surrounding things in its environment it'll reflect and take up. Uh, gold is a mess. It it's tough. It's uh, artistically it's underrated. It's definitely well appreciated. Um, but yeah, definitely. Um, I think people assume uh, it's simpler than it is a lot of the time. So he's got these arrows, and I figured he's living in the woods he is making his own arrows likely or finding them and so he's either going to be pulling them out of the quivers of guys that he's killed namely orcs and monsters or he's making them out of uh, found resources in which case it's kind of like he'll take the feathers from any bird he can kill um, I mean he could probably tra track down particular birds and do it more formally, but I thought it'd be nice of, of showing him not having necessarily the pick of the litter as far as supplies go. Uh, so I gave him a mix of arrow, uh, arrow feathers, flights, uh, just to sh sort of show a bit more of a, you know, resources, like a scarcity. He's, he's making do. So with his bow, I wanted it to be something um, like with with his military background and, and this sort of his story, I, I wanted his bow to be kind of like the the big ugly Russian sniper rifle of bows, but also um, so I started it off with this big sort of shape here, but I also wanted it to look like something that he had made himself out in the woods, and it was fairly well made, simple but well done. Uh, especially because of his family history as being worshippers of Gond and, you know, the gods of craftsmanship and they were woodworkers. And I think he would have some sort of innate interest in it uh, um, just from as little time as he spent with his family. But um, not sort of like your typical, um, like, f fancy ornate bow, but something a bit more um, utilitarian. So very simple. Um sort of bulky and heavy. He could, he could probably use it as like a club. It would have quite a bit of weight to it. I tried making a bow once out of a tree in my backyard uh, when I lived out in the country, but it, it, was, it was really hard and I never finished it. Very hard. So yeah. Fairly rough hewn handle. Um, and some reductions on the side, but uh, he made it himself. And then knocking it, the, there's some knocking points. I find that for some reason I often draw people with their bows um, with the string out. I don't know why. I think it just seems natural to me. That I'd, I'd assume that people would... Uh, transport bows with the string out, but who knows. Uh, and also, um, just for um, memory's sake, I did those things on the inside of his uh, his armor cape there, are some badges. Just for his own memory, they're out of sight so that people don't identify him or know his history. Um, but I thought he'd, he might keep them around just to, they might even be the, the badges of his fallen friends that he's kept with him. Uh, I think he'd, he'd like that sort of thing. But and also on his hands, um, I gave him that little band-aid or that little strap around that one finger. And then it's really, it's, I'm, I'm really reaching, but giving him a, like a, a blood blister under his, under his thumbnail, where it's just sort of like that, that I've known a lot of like craftsmen or craftsmen and engineers, and they all, they often have, uh, uh, bruises <laughs> under their fingernails from working in the shop and I thought that might be kind of like a good gone craftsmanship but uh, uh, prodigal son kind of kind of little hint there but that's just no one's going to get that but anyway this was Alice for Manuel for the free character art lottery held every um, Monday every week 
Um, just follow me on Twitter at R&D Fantasy, and uh, on Sunday, I'll let you know what to tweet on Monday before Tuesday, and that's how you enter all your original fantasy um, characters for tabletop. Um, but if you win, then I draw your D&D character for free. Hope it helped. Thanks, guys.